people has dubbed fourth meal as the meal in between dinner and breakfast, encouraging individuals to eat late in the day. So maybe this isn't really a problem. Some have suggested that frequent snacking, multiple small meals might be helpful for weight loss. So let's look at that evidence and see if this is indeed true. If multiple small meals are protective for our weight and our waistlines, it would seem that this trend of increasing snacking and increasing number of meals would be associated with weight loss over time. Unfortunately, our practical experience and the scientific literature both show that that particular trend has not happened. Americans are gaining weight at an unprecedented rate. And why is this? There's probably many reasons, but one specific reason is that we are not good at monitoring our caloric intake. See this chip in the picture? Guess how many calories is in that one chip? Hmm, typically right around 15 calories. Now, if you're eating three times a day and you have one extra chip at each meal, just one, then you have consumed 45 extra calories in a day. But if you're eating six times or 10 times in a day, that could add up really, really quickly. And if we're eating unconsciously, just eating at whatever time of day or night without really thinking about it, it is even more likely that we are going to consume more calories than is ideal. And this will put us on a path toward additional weight gain. What we do know <clears throat> is that intentional strategies for weight loss are beneficial. Even something as simple as keeping a food diary where you write down what you ate in a day can help. So if you approach eating multiple small meals in an intentional manner, planning out those meals, planning when you're going to eat them so that you are reducing your overall caloric intake, it can be beneficial for weight loss, but it is not superior to other approaches. We'll talk more about those other approaches as we move on. In one study that was done right here at Loma Linda University Health, the Adventist Health Study Research Team asked a question about weight loss over time. They said, how many times do people eat in a day? And then how does their weight change over time? And they looked at that in a large population to see what would happen with their body mass index. Now, body mass index is a very medical term, and it's how we measure someone's weight for their height. How tall are you? How much do you weigh for your height? And a lower number is better so that your weight is lower for your height. So let's orient ourselves just a little bit with this figure. It's going to be very similar to other figures we're going to look at as we move on. This red line in the middle is what we call kind of our neutral line. Things below this red line have <clears throat> uh, decreasing BMI or decreasing risk of weight gain over time. Things above the line have increasing weight gain over time. So let's look at the people who are eating one to two meals a day. We see them here below the line, decreased risk, their BMI is actually going to improve as time goes on. So that's interesting. The neutral line is actually at, set at the three meals per day. So those who are eating three meals a day, their BMI is not going up, their BMI is not going down, they're staying steady over time. Now, what about those over in this far corner who are eating six or more meals per day. That's a lot. And in my mind, this likely represents a shift towards more snacking behavior, where you're eating more meals, smaller meals throughout the day. And unfortunately, when we snack, we tend to not eat real food. That's the time when we give ourselves permission to eat junk food if you will. Times when we say, I don't need to have fruits and vegetables, that's rarely what we think of as a snack. It tends to be our cheating time. So my tip in this particular area related to number of meals is no matter how often you eat, think of every eating occasion as a meal and eat real food. So Adele Davis made this famous statement that many of you may have heard, eat breakfast like a king, 
lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper. So do we think that's true? Was she correct when she made this statement? We did not have all the evidence that we currently have about it. It may have been a well-informed guest. <clears throat> Let's talk about what each of these meals is, how we define them. And that might seem obvious for those of us who eat a regular breakfast, eat a regular three meals a day, but it's not necessarily obvious for the rest of the world. So breakfast can be defined as the first meal of the day, eaten within two hours of waking up, and that's typically between 5 a.m. and 10 a.m. Lunch and dinner, much more difficult to define. <clears throat> Um, the American Heart Association says anytime you eat more than 210 calories, we should call that maybe lunch or dinner. Um, it's obviously not breakfast. And I think that one of the ways that this, um, that I think about this is different cultures. So probably at the most extreme example would be the culture in um, Europe, in Spain, where lunch may be much later in the afternoon, and then they have dinner typical dinner time starts around 8, 9, 10 p.m. And so every culture is a little different and that's why it makes it difficult to define this. I think as Americans, we actually have more standard expectations for what lunch and dinner is than the rest of the world. So is breakfast the most important meal of the day? Like our moms taught us when we were rushing out of the door in elementary school or high school. Well, let's look at the evidence. Here we have the red neutral line and those who are friends who are not eating breakfast sit right on this line. So their BMI, their body mass index, their weight for their height is not changing over time. It's stable. So I guess that's good news, but here's the better news for the rest of us uh, who do eat breakfast. We can see that although our friends are up here, we are down here having a relative change of improvement in BMI over time based on the, the um, category of eating breakfast. So um, I've been a fairly regular breakfast eater except for a brief hiatus in college. And this uh, made me thankful that I've been doing it all along. So in addition, there are some specific risks to skipping breakfast. So we know that there's the benefit of having a lower BMI, but those who skip breakfast do not get as much vitamins and minerals throughout their day. Those who skip breakfast only get 41% uh, of their vitamin and mineral intake versus 74% who do eat breakfast. They get a much larger percentage of those vitamins and minerals that they need. Um, it also is associated with a higher blood sugar, which increases the risk for type two diabetes. And it increases the risk for high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And as we all know, those are then associated with increased risk of heart attack and stroke. So the simple tip for this one, eat breakfast. It's good for you and good for your waistline. But what meal should be the largest? That's one of the questions I frequently get from my patients after I've just told them the evidence that they should eat breakfast, but they say, but I hate breakfast. So should I eat, can I just have a cup of coffee and, um, and one egg? Or can I have a small bowl of oatmeal? Can I just eat the smallest amount of thing, uh, food possible for breakfast and then move on and have larger meals later in the day? Well, we are all free agents. You can do whatever what you want, but here's the evidence. Those who have breakfast, you can see on the far side over here, the lowest circle are those who make breakfast the largest meal of the day. L having lunch as the largest meal is also protective, but dinner as the largest meal should be avoided at all costs. So if you're not naturally a breakfast friendly person, you could maybe make that meal a little bit smaller, make lunch a larger meal and then minimize breakfast. But regardless, dinner should be quite small. There's additional risks for this if dinner is the largest meal and it has been associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And that's very concerning. So my tip is, if possible, if it works with your rest of your life, you're able to do it, make breakfast your largest meal, lunch slightly smaller, dinner a bit smaller yet. 
And no discussion on this topic would be complete without addressing intermittent fasting, which is one of the most popular topics in nutrition and weight loss science currently in our American culture. So there's actually three types of intermittent fasting. Most people are not aware of that fact. So we'll talk about each of them and a little bit about the science behind each of them. First is alternate day fasting. This is where you feast one day, fast the next day, feast one day, fast the next day. You keep alternating every other day, feasting or fasting. Periodic fasting has kind of two different patterns. You can have what is known as a 5-2 pattern. You may see that in the literature where you feast for several days. You have two fast days consecutively, and then you continue to feast. Or you could have non-consecutive fasting days interspersed among those feasting days where you have a shorter length of fasting. Now on to the one that most people think of when they think of intermittent fasting. This is called actually time-restricted feeding. And you may have a friend who says, I eat in a window of time. I do intermittent fasting. This is what they're talking about, that they have a time-restricted window when they eat and they don't eat for the whole rest of the day. Typically, these windows can be as small as four hours or as large as 12 hours. So let's back up a little bit and talk about the alternate day periodic fasting approach and the evidence around that. And then we will come back to the time restricted feeding. With alternate day fasting, those who are successful on this dietary, who are not successful on this dietary approach tend to have a problem with overeating on their feast days, or they eat unhealthy food and more calories on their fast days because they're not closely monitoring their intake. As long as they don't do that, if they feast and just eat a, a normal amount of food, there's not any typical guidelines for this, but they eat maybe the typical amount for a day or just a tiny bit more. And then on their fast days, they can have between zero and 100 calories, depending on the type of feast fasts um, that they choose. This average reduces caloric intake by about 25%. So you can see that over time, someone could reduce their calories every day by 25%, or they could reduce their calories every other day more significantly. The average is about the same. And the outcomes for weight loss are very similar. Over 12 weeks, people tend to lose in most studies between four and 8% of their weight. Um, this is associated with lower blood pressure, lower triglycerides, However, in some studies, the cholesterol has not improved. And so we would encourage you if, if this is an attractive pattern to keep an eye on your cholesterol and see if your cholesterol does go down, um, if that's one of your laboratory values or risks that you are following. In addition, this is probably not an ideal plan for diabetics or those who struggle with blood sugar control because the risk of hypoglycemia is real especially if they do the 5-2 pattern where they have a 48-hour 40, window of uh, fasting. So if you want to follow this pattern, I would highly recommend that you discuss it with your healthcare provider if you have any health conditions, especially if you're going to do the 5-2 pattern um, and monitor yourself for hypoglycemia, see how you feel. And you know, some patients say that they find this particular pattern really difficult in the beginning, but then after one to two weeks, their hunger cues begin to improve as their body adapts to the pattern and it becomes easier to follow the diet. So this is probably less popular, but can be an effective tool for weight loss, but probably not superior to what we typically think of where patients are just focusing on reducing calories every day by a specific amount. So the take home point for this is if you want to have feast days and fast days, we need to make sure that our choices are healthy on both of those days in terms of how much calories we take in and how, how the quality of those calories on each of those days so that we're not eating junk food on our fast days because it's the freebie day. And so we're eating 500 calories of cookies. Um, that would be not a wise choice and doesn't help support the improvement in chronic disease risk overall. 
What about time-restricted feeding? So now back to this popular one, intermittent fasting, as we typically think of it, time-restricted feeding and the window. So there's kind of two things that we need to think about when we think about the window. The length of the window is important and the timing of the window in a given day is important. When we think about the timing of the window, an early window seems to be superior to a late window. So we see improvements if your window is from morning to afternoon in BMI, in blood pressure, in blood sugar, and in cholesterol. We're not sure all the mechanisms why this works, but we think some of them may include that we tend to eat more calories later in the day, that risk of having the large dinner. We also tend to eat more unhealthy foods later in the day. So by having that early window, we avoid some of those temptations or inclinations, if you will, that come with food that we might give ourselves as a reward at the end of our day. <clears throat> the other thought process about this window timing is that this correlates well with our natural circadian rhythms. We get up in the morning, we are getting ready to be active for our day. So we eat our food and then we have all day to burn that energy. And so that aligns better with our circadian rhythms or our sleep wake cycles. What if the window is late in the day? I have a lot of friends who prefer this particular method because it's nice to go home in the evening and have dinner with your family. And so there's some social cues that seem to, to work better with the, a late window of time-restricted feeding. Well, unfortunately, even though in the studies that we've looked at, the BMI tends to decrease, unfortunately, the blood pressure and the cholesterol has a tendency to go up in these situations. And so because of that, um, I would recommend avoiding this particular uh, pattern and at a minimum monitoring your blood pressure and cholesterol and seeing if it's being negatively impacted if you do have a late window in the day. And this kind of makes sense, again, with the whole circadian rhythm idea that you wake up in the morning, you work throughout the day, you burn all those calories, and then you eat and go to sleep. It's a little more biologically aligned to eat early in the day, burn the calories, and then go to sleep once our stomachs are empty and our whole body can rest overnight. So as much as possible, it's prefer preferred to plan a window for eating that's as early in the day as possible that you can do consistently so that you're not switching from one thing, one, one plan one day to another plan the next day, early window, late window, plan a consistent window, but as early in the day as possible will be better for your overall health from what we're able to see in the current literature. What about the time in between meals? <clears throat> we know it's better to eat less frequently as we saw in some of the earlier slides and to have larger meals at the end of the day, but how much time do we need in between those meals? It does seem like it's best to have a bit longer rest period for our guts in between those meals. Five to six hours is associated with the um, body mass index, the BMI improving over time. And we see that on this side of this particular figure, Whereas on the far side of the figure, we see those whose window of overnight fasting is only seven to 11 hours. So these may be the people who are the ones that are not eating between the 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. and they're having the fourth meal at Taco Bell. And it's, it's natural for us to sometimes have those late night munchies, um, but it does seem to be associated with increasing BMI over time. So 12 hours overnight fast seems to be a minimum for health benefits. 14 hours um, is ideal, but you can continue to get more benefit um, if you go up to 18 hours for that overnight fast. So that would be a very short um, window in the daytime of eating and then 18 hours overnight where you are not consuming any calories. And for those in the ideal and longer windows, 14 hours, 15 hours, 16 hours, we see benefits for cardiovascular disease and even cancer recurrence. Specifically, breast cancer recurrence was found to be much lower in women who went 13 to 14 hours or more between their evening meal and their breakfast meal. 
So this is actually what I personally do myself as much as possible. I try to eat breakfast where you see those yellow circles on the screen. I try to have my breakfast around 730 and then I try to have my lunch between 1 and 2 p.m. I push it off a little bit. I eat a healthy, filling, significant breakfast. It's, it's a really big bowl of oatmeal with nuts and fruits and lots of good things, seeds. Um, and when I eat something that's not processed, I actually do not find it that difficult to last until the early afternoon. If I eat more typical cold cereal, um, I have that sense of needing to eat a little bit sooner. And you may be different, but that's, that's how I feel. So then I'm able to make it until two o'clock. I have my lunch in the afternoon. Again, nice big meal, make sure that I have vegetables, that I have beans, legumes, um, maybe some nuts, uh, maybe some whole grains. And then I don't eat again until the next morning at 730. And I've had amazing results with my patients who followed this meal pattern. Their blood sugars improve, their weight begins to drop. Um, and overall, their chronic disease risk factors begin to improve. Now, sometimes I can't do this due to social reasons, there's a meal served over noon and I have to eat it, or I know that there's going to be a dinner that I'm going to participate in. And for social reasons, I want to engage in that. If that's the case, I maintain the same large breakfast, have a medium lunch, and then try to eat a very, very light dinner. So just kind of have more of hors d'oeuvres for dinner if it's a served meal um, and to cut back on those calories a bit. And that has seemed to be, to be helpful. <clears throat> so I would recommend that you aim for at least 14 hours between the last meal of the day and breakfast the next morning for, for better health outcomes. Next, we did not discuss water only fasting on the slide about intermittent fasting because it is a slightly different type of fasting, but no conversation about fasting would be complete without talking about this. And I'm going to just touch on it very briefly. The evidence is quite compelling that hypo hypoglycemia risk and also risk for electrolyte imbalances can be significant. Also, if you're doing this for weight loss, within the first three weeks, you lose more protein than you lose fat. And that's not what any of us want when we're trying to trim our waistlines. So you have to go beyond that three month, three week time period to see the fat loss overtake the protein loss. And that type of a fast should only be done under intense physician supervision. Um, so in general, fasting for more than one to two days is not recommended for weight loss. So here's a few quick tips. Eat early, including breakfast. Have two to three meals per day. Maintain a schedule that's as consistent as possible to align with your circadian rhythms and also so that you're not treating your body to a jet lag experience every single day by changing up your meal cycle. Try to fast at least 14 hours overnight as often as you can and no snacks. Think of every meal, even if it is a snack, as an opportunity to eat real food with all the bright colors as we've shown in this picture here. April, good conversation starters there and some really good information. We've got a couple of questions that have come in. One is how come skipping breakfast causes higher blood sugar? It seems paradoxical, though the research shows it. Absolutely, that's a great question. Well, when you've been fasting for a little while, your pancreas um, secretes a hormone called glucagon that then tells your liver to release glycogen, which, which gets converted into glucose. So basically it kicks off a pathway that ends up in sugar production from your own liver, from your own body. So even though you haven't taken anything um, through your mouth, your body is telling you that it needs to release um, that glucose from your liver. And then... <laughs> Um, if you have a tendency to be insulin resistant, if you have, a, you know, kind of those very, very early beginnings of diabetes, maybe it hasn't actually shown up um, at the level that the labs are positive, but you're beginning that down that pathway, um, you may not have enough insulin to take care of it and to, to get it back into yourselves. And so you'll see this rise in blood sugar um, early in the day uh, because your body is trying to compensate 
um, for the fact that you haven't had breakfast. Thank you. And Dr. Olson, another one. Um, if you're vegan, who, if you are a vegan who is underweight, how can you increase your BMI in a healthy way? That is also a good question. I have um, a patient who um, actually I've been helping them with this over the past couple of years. And, you know, it's not, um, it's kind of the opposite problem that many people struggle with. Um, many people are struggling to lose weight, but some um, would like to gain a little bit of weight. So generally I recommend that they look for within plant-based, plant-strong options to look for foods that are more um, calorically dense. So the least calorie dense foods are often your greens, lettuce, um, kale, broccoli, you know, some of those types of foods. And they're still excellent, excellent options. You shouldn't cut them out of your diet entirely, but you might want to move your diet a little more towards maybe some beans, some grains, and then probably one of the other ones that can be helpful um, is some of the nuts and seeds. If you have access to that or, you know, it fits into your budget. Um, <clears throat> It would also be a time if you're truly borderlining on the under underweight to maybe think about some of the things that I would consider to be um, not 100% whole food, but pretty close. So nut butters um, would be one example, almond butter, um, peanut butter, cashew butter, sunflower seed butter. Um, for my general patient, I would say, you know, try to avoid those because they're pretty calorically dense. It's easy to take in a lot of food in a very short period of time and maybe add a few extra calories on or for the underweight person, that can be a, a reasonably healthy tactic to try to um, bump those calories up a little bit and have some safe, healthy weight, weight gain over a period of time. Thank you. That there's This person also said, thank you so much for the very enlightening lecture and, and the information shared. Another question, is the quality of food we eat more important or meal timing more important? That is a very, very good question. I think that they probably both matter. Um, and I think that the quality of the food is certainly important, but we're learning more and more about how that time, particularly like late in the day, um, can really have an impact on how our body handles those calories, how it processes them. Um, we have a sense that probably particularly like carbohydrates eaten towards the end of the day might actually um, result in more weight gain than if you ate the same carbohydrates at the beginning of the day. Um, so it's just a very interesting dynamic. It's not a huge difference, but there is maybe a noticeable difference there. So I do think that the meal timing matters. Um, but if you're only eating junk food at all of those meals, your body will not be nourished. You will have a shortfall in all of the, you know, the fiber, the minerals, the vitamins, all the things that really help your body to heal um, and help your body to function optimally. So probably the truth is that both matter. Um, for people who have to kind of choose between one or the other, I would say try to maybe look at the quality of the food slightly ahead of the timing piece because I think we have more compelling evidence for that particular part. But I think that ultimately both are very important. Great, thank you. And another question that came in and I will encourage uh, the attendees, please put your questions into the Q&A and we will answer those as well. Another one that came in, any suggestions for people who do not like breakfast? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, so if you just don't like breakfast and don't like eating it, um, generally I'll suggest trying to start with something um, light that is a food that you like that's relatively easy to grab and eat. So a piece of toast, a whole grain toast, um, an apple, um, you know, maybe you take it with you in the car. Um, sometimes I'll recommend to people to wait a little bit if it's hard. Some people like to eat right when they wake up. So, you know, wait 20 minutes, wait 30 minutes, wait an hour. It's still better to eat something, you know, an hour or two after you've woken up than to wait all the way until two or three in the afternoon. So, um, I just basically encourage them to kind of approximate whatever they can manage with their own personal lifestyle and work schedule, home school schedule, um, school, whatever it is. 
um, try to approximate as close as you can to getting that breakfast in. So eating something, eating something that um, is manageable, that's not overwhelming, start small, and then maybe begin to increase over time. If you're, if you're convinced on the evidence and you're like, I want to get to be a big breakfast eater eventually, don't feel like you have to do it all at once and get discouraged, right? It's okay to start smaller and then progress in that direction. Great. So a question here also about LCIF diets in the low carb. Um, can you enlighten us if it's healthy or not? Got it. Low carb. Well, I think that um, it's a complicated question, but in general, um, low carb diets, particularly those that are higher fat um, and low protein, um, so like a typical ketogenic diet, um, have actually been found to have increased mortality. So, and the closer you follow the diet, um, the higher your risk of mortality is. So I generally advise my patients to try to avoid that. Now, those risks are mitigated by um, having more of a plant-based approach. So if that, is, does, um, if that does appeal to you or you found it to be effective, I would just encourage the, the individuals who are following that to try to move as close to a plant-based um, ketogenic or low carb type of diet as possible. There's just a lot of benefits to things that have carbs in them. So beans and legumes are one of the, one of the foods that in almost every study around the world has been shown to have benefit. Um, but a lot of times individuals who are following a low carb dietary pattern will try to reduce that um, as well as some vegetables that come along with really healthy vitamins and minerals. So for those reasons, um, I don't feel like you need to do a low carb diet. Um, and I would just encourage those who want to do it to try to think about how to make it as plant strong as possible. Very good. All right, another question. For those who are in the night shift where they are very tired early morning and really want to sleep, should they still eat breakfast? That's a great question. And so I, what I would say is there's a, there are a lot of risks that come along with being a night shift worker. And yet here I am in the healthcare profession, right? So some of us have chosen to take on these risks because it's important to us or because we, um, we want to serve in that capacity um, or because, um, you know, it's the shift that was available to us. So this is where we are. We have to deal with the situation. So in general, what I encourage people to do is to try to make your night shift as much like someone else's typical day shift as possible, and then make everybody else's day as much like a night as possible. So during the night shift, bright lights. Um, have a breakfast at the beginning of the shift, just like someone else would do in the morning, um, and kind of follow that pattern throughout your day. And then when you go to sleep at night, make it as dark as possible. So essentially trying to kind of trick your body at some level to have the circadian rhythm um, around the night shift and then try to minimize switching back and forth between day and nights as much as you can. And I recognize that that can be a challenge, but as much as you can, there will be benefits um, from that, from what we understand in the literature so far. Okay, great. Another one, what about a green smoothie for breakfast? Is that sufficient? So smoothies are very popular and often an easy, you know, take grab and go type of thing. And um, among those of us who love talking about this, um, we, we talk about the smoothies and the green smoothies in the world of smoothies are some of the best smoothies. So if you're going to do a smoothie, that's one of the best ones. Um, there are some individuals who, who um, have a perspective that because the food is pulverized into such tiny, tiny particles, that it's going to cause a little more of a bump in blood sugar. Now, if it's a green smoothie versus a fruit smoothie, um, that risk again will be a little bit lower because the green smoothies don't tend to have as much of the sugar like you would in maybe like a fruit smoothie that's strawberries, blueberries, and bananas. But regardless, the particle size is smaller, so it's less work for your stomach to do, which means that it's gonna break it down and absorb it faster. So what I would say is, if you have the opportunity to chew your food, that's usually better. But if a smoothie is the way that you're gonna get those veggies in for the day, and it's not, there's not another option, by all means, have the green smoothie. It's a huge, great step in the right direction. Um, and you don't need to beat yourself up about it. <laughs> great. Um, then there's somebody wants to know, just a personal question, what is your go-to breakfast? My go-to breakfast. 
um, rolled oats. Um, I actually make it in the morning. So it's very popular as something called overnight oats, but I don't make it overnight. I actually make it in the morning, just kind of like a cold breakfast cereal, but it's rolled old or old fashioned oats, um, <clears throat> a small handful of slivered almonds, um, and then always blueberries. I usually get, have frozen blueberries, um, but it could be any, any type of fruit that you like. And then something else. So maybe half a banana or some strawberries or raspberries or blackberries. The blueberries are pretty sweet. So that helps me to be able to eat it without um, feeling like I have to add any other source of sugar or anything like that. And then I top it with either soy milk or almond milk, typically soy milk. Um, and it has a really nice profile, tons of fiber, lots of protein. Um, even though you might think of it as a carb, it's got a lot of protein um, as well as a lot of other good nutrients. So that, that sets me up and fills me up pretty well for the day. Excellent. Uh, someone here is asking, what can I do that eating vegetables and fruits will be delicious and appealing to me so that I can lessen and avoid meat foods, processed foods? That is a great question. And I will just say that this is a journey, right? So um, don't beat yourself up. There's no shame here, or no guilt here. Um, but um, begin to experiment, begin to try new recipes, find things that are maybe kind of close to what you already know you like, um, maybe slightly different spices, different you know, preparation techniques, but similar things. And then also challenge yourself to branch out a little bit if you're open to that and maybe try some other um, fruits and vegetables because probably most of us go to the store um, or the market each week and buy the same five, 10, 15 fruits and veggies. Um, but there might be you know, 30 or 60 or 100 in the store. So there may be that one of those ones that you haven't tried yet um, is something that you would really love. Um, some places have um, farm shares or opportunities to try, you know, the food that's in season and, and prepare it in new ways along with recipes and things like that. So um, I, for myself, it's been a gradual process. Um, I just, you know, try a new recipe that looks good, find out if I like it or not. If I like it, I add it to the routine. If not, I remove it, try something new. Um, and it's been a gradual process, but definitely rewarding. And there's definitely things that I've tried that I would not repeat again. So, <laughs> um, learning for you and your family and whomever you're cooking for can, can be a fun adventure and try to get some friends to go along the journey with you. Cause that can be really fun, um, to kind of share and swap recipes and, and um, try some new things. Yeah, that is a helpful way to do it. Um, so uh, there's a question in Miranda, if I don't quite get it correct, um, you help me out here, but they asked, is it good to go juicing for a lifetime? So I'm wondering about, I think maybe intake of juicing some of your fruits and vegetables. Is that a good practice? So typically the, the, the nutrients follow the fiber. And when you juice, you remove the fiber. So to a large degree, um, you're not getting the, the bulk of the fruits and vegetables that would be available to you if you remove the fiber. There are some scenarios, certain um, diseases and things where there's been some studies that have shown that juicing um, may actually be beneficial um, because uh, without having all the volume of the fiber, then maybe you can get more nutrients in, but I'm not fully convinced of that yet because if you look at uh, kind of a before and after of the same ingredients, um, non-juiced, you know, maybe you throw them into a smoothie. So everything is there, even though it's ground up into a small particle, you look at it after it's juicing and it's often um, somewhere between five and 20% of the uh, nutrients that would, would have been in that item. Um, the vitamin A, the vitamin C, you know, all these different things that are so good for us. It's so much lower if you've juiced it and the fiber is gone. So as a general rule, I encourage if you, if that's something that will be helpful to you as a technique, try to go with the smoothie um, so that you're still getting all the nutrients. Okay. That's, that's good. Um, okay. So I want to have a treat. Is there an ideal time to have it? <laughs> and when I'm thinking treat, maybe I'm thinking a bite of chocolate that might not be always approved, but when can I have a treat? Sure. Right. Uh, that's a great question because we do have celebratory meals, right? We have times when we want to celebrate a birthday or a holiday or something like that. And um, we may not be as, as careful on those occasions about every single um, bite that we eat. So interestingly, we tend to often have these 
less healthy items with our lunch or our dinner. But remember earlier when I mentioned about how eating carbs, particularly late in the, carbohydrates late in the day or treats later in the day kind of is handled differently. It's actually probably best if we eat that um, treat food, whether it's a piece of chocolate or a cookie or a bite of cake or you know whatever it is, probably best to have it as early in the day as possible. Maybe with breakfast, which is not how my mother raised me. <laughs> she said I had to wait till dinner and have it after the meal. But there is something to suggest that um, having it earlier in the day is better. And then I just recently heard some emerging evidence. I don't know if it's going to turn out to be true when we look at it, you know, in bigger studies, but that perhaps eating um, those treats um, at the end of the meal um, is better. So that is often the pattern, but they also talked about like, sometimes when you go out to eat, there'll be a, a basket of bread put on your table. It's actually better to eat, even if you eat the same amount of bread and the same amount of food over the course of the meal, eating the bread at the end of the meal instead of the beginning um, helps um, with the way your body processes it metabolically, um, which I thought was fascinating. So scary. we'll see. I think the jury's still out on that one, but it did make me curious and make me think, hey, I'm going to try it out a little bit and see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Um, do you get hungry or have feelings of low blood sugar when you eat less frequently? So I think, you know, particularly if you're a diabetic, you have to monitor carefully for, and there are some individuals who struggle with a condition of hypoglycemia without having diabetes. So aside from those people, I did th definitely think that we have these natural rhythms that we've become accustomed to. When I first switched from eating three meals a day to eating two meals a day, it was really hard. All those cues at lunchtime that tell you that it's time to eat or dinner time that it's time to eat were very strong. Um, and so I would often feel very hungry. But what I found is when I eat less processed food, um, I don't get that kind of like, oh my goodness, I'm so hungry, I'm shaky, I need to eat kind of sense. And I don't think I have hypoglycemia per se, but I would sometimes have that when I would eat like a cold cereal for breakfast or processed food for breakfast. As I switched over to um, the the less refined foods, less processed foods, that has actually um, improved dramatically. And that afternoon slump that I think a lot of us feel where we're really tired, it's essentially gone. As long as I don't eat processed foods, the afternoon, I feel great. I don't feel like I need to take a nap, um, you know, unless I really was short on my sleep the night before. But even on a night where I maybe got a little bit less sleep, I actually feel so much better and feel really productive in the afternoon. So overall, I think it helps, but there will be an adjustment period and it can be a little painful to get through. But after you get through it, your body really can settle into that rhythm. Um, and it's really not an issue for me anymore. Like it's very easy for me to do two meals a day. I feel pretty good all day long. That's good. Um, so a question back to fasting, and I don't know if it matters on which of the fasting times, but is that just kind of a short term, like weight management option, or is that a pattern for, for life for people? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. I'm not sure that the one meal a day is ideally sustainable longer term, but I think the two meals a day really is. And certainly three meals, especially if you make it kind of the big meal, medium meal, small meal, very sustainable. Um, and so I would recommend generally to people to either do the two meals a day or the three meals a day with the gradually decreasing size of the meals, either one of those. And then just trying to have dinner as relatively early as possible, you know, five or 6 PM so that you have a really nice long fast overnight until you have breakfast again the next morning to lengthen that window. So a question, because I know you have kids as well. Do you have them practice the same type of eating schedule? Because they sure like to eat more. Yeah. Well, my children are in school, so they have kind of set meal time. So they do the three meals a day. <clears throat> um, and so, no, I don't have them follow the same things so with, you know, breakfast is about the same time for all of us. And then I go to work um, and they're at school. And so their lunchtime is often a bit earlier, 1130, 12. I do know some folks that do this with their children. So I don't think that it's um, impossible to do with your kids. Um, you just want to make sure they're getting adequate nutrition, adequate calories. Um, and I certainly think that that's possible in two meals a day. That's just going to be two bigger meals. Um, <clears throat> but three meals a day is also, I think, manageable for that. Um, and if your child is, you know, struggling, let's say they're eating six meals, six meals a day or six 
six to 10 times a day, like we talked about the frequent um, eating. Um, it could be an opportunity for your child, you know, if your child is struggling with their weight or starting to have some risk factors to kind of manage that, pull it down to just the three meals a day um, <clears throat> and seeing how, how they feel on that. Okay. I think that's helpful. Um, cause I know when they hit those growth spurts, it feels like sometimes you can't feed them enough because they're always hungry and it's making sure number one, that it's not processed food, but it's also just things that are going to keep them full. Um, another question has come in. What is the advantage? Mm -hmm. What advantage is fasting and two meals on health? What for your health, what are the advantages of fasting and, and two meals? Sure. Um, so I'm going to answer this in the context of fasting, um, kind of that, that intermittent fasting type of pattern with the two meals a day. Um, so it will help lower insulin resistance typically, and it gives your body a time to rest. So when you're eating more frequently throughout the day, your body, your, your stomach, your GI tract, your intestines, um, may not get a nice long rest. And your um, stomach and intestines actually makes a lot of hormones, a lot of other chemicals that are important to your body. Um, and so giving that GI tract a chance to rest and recuperate can actually have um, benefits for reducing inflammation um, and, and other processes in the body. But probably the most well-studied one is that it can help reduce insulin resistance by having that longer fast overnight. Great. I'm looking to see if there are any more questions. Not currently. Um, we'll just invite you if you do have questions, we'll put them in the Q&A. But otherwise, it looks like we're about done fielding questions. Um, any? I loved. I love the way your slides had tips on each one of them. That's a great way to. Those are great takeaways, because you know the data can get overwhelming, but the super helpful tip. Uh, comes in handy. Um, any other last thoughts or encouragement for people who are looking to maybe change the way they eat, do less snacking? Um, any other little tips or pieces of uh, advice that you can share? Absolutely. There's probably some of you out there that are all or nothing type of people who, you know, will say like, I'm, I heard all of this. I'm going to do it all. You know, I'm going to do less processed food. I'm going to do less animal products. I'm going to do my meal timing, two meals a day. I'm going to make breakfast, my bigger meal. And that's fabulous. That's super awesome. Um, and certainly if you have more chronic health conditions, you know, the more efforts that we make, the more benefit you're going to see. Um, just like dosing a drug at a higher dose, going to, you know, have um, greater benefits. However, there's a lot of people that aren't on, in that group, right? They're on a journey. And so if that's you, then I would just encourage you to identify one or two things and say, this is the thing I'm going to work on. So many years ago, um, I decided that I wanted to work on being plant-based, not even whole food plant-based, but I was trying to move in that direction. So I just want to try to eliminate the animal, some of the animal products, particularly for me, having grown up as a vegetarian, I wanted to eliminate cheese um, and eggs um, and milk. So I started on that. After I started to feel comfortable with that, then I said, okay, now I want to reduce processed foods. That's the next step for me. Some people might do it opposite. They might reduce processed foods first and then tackle something else later. And then I'd say that recently in the last few years, I've really started to really intentionally think about the meal timing um, and try to be um, careful about that and kind of um, intentional for every day to say like, this is when I'm going to have my meals is I'm planning it. Um, and the other parts have gotten a little easier, right? The, the, the plant-based products, um, the, sorry, the plant-based foods, the less refined foods, like all of that has kind of, um, happened over time. So, you know, if you're on that same journey with me, I totally understand. And each of us is going to be, um, on it at our own pace and, and, um, just headed in the right direction, right? We want to head towards better health, um, less disability, hopefully a longer life, um, where we can, you know, live the good life that God has intended for us. Um, one other comment that someone says, how can I get your presentation? And they're wondering if you'd be willing to share your email contact. Um, I'm going to say here, if they would be willing to share their email in the um, Q and a that you could probably share some of your presentation with them. I do know that once the camp meeting has ended, they have told us that the presentations will be available for viewing 
for 30 days. They won't be able to be downloaded, but you can view them. But if you would like to maybe talk or get some information from Dr. Wilson, if you would uh, like to put your email in the chat, be happy to pull that out and share it with Dr. Wilson and she can get back with you on that. Sure, and and this there's a similar version of this talk because um, it's been a very popular one that That's is posted true. on Loma Linda's YouTube site, which is externally available. So if you search for my name, April Wilson, on Loma Linda University Health's YouTube site, you can look for meal timing. It'll pop right up. So I've actually um, prescribed it to several of my patients that really had disordered eating patterns for them to watch it and learn. Um, and so it just might be another place for you to find it. Um, if you need it, if you want to look at it more than 30 days from now. Yes. And that's actually a really good point. And I will tell you that if you visit the Loma Linda University Health booth, it's on the Ellen White Pavilion, um, at, during this global camp meeting, uh, we do have a link to our YouTube site where you have uh, Dr. Wilson's talk and lots of other really good health presentations that are there for you, but you can search for her name and that will come up. That's actually the, probably the best way to go for that. Okay, I think we have maybe answered all the questions. Um, if Okay, I'm gonna grab an email here before we disconnect everything. But any other questions um, before we wrap up? I know for most of you, maybe you're just starting your day, but we are really ending our day. <laughs> and it's, it's great. We love being able to talk with you all. Being here live with you is really, um, really a great thing. Okay, I am gonna continue to take some notes here because I'm getting some emails in the chat. So April, I'm gonna, Dr. Wilson, it's it's kind of funny when I know you both ways, but Dr. Wilson, if you would just any other last minute things while I grab some is fine. <laughs> notes. <laughs> That's I'm gonna grab cool. some emails here. Okay. Yeah, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to get to share with all of you something that I think is interesting and fun to talk about. <laughs> exactly. Actually, do I have someone on from the GC? Is there a way that I can capture these emails faster than trying to copy them? I think we maybe get a list of everybody who attended, but I am gonna just because it's gonna take me a minute to sit here and copy these, but it's great. <laughs> Sorry, did you have a question about Something? So we'll, so people are giving us their emails because they would like to get the presentation and get other information. Is there a way that we can capture these emails after the presentation is over? Uh, you'll, you'll get a list of all those who attended your seminar. Perfect. Uh, at the end. Uh, so probably, you know, early next week, you should receive all of the emails. Okay. So to those of you attending, I am going to not kind of try and keep grabbing all of these emails that was more than I thought it was going to be. Um, but we will get them as once they send those to this, then we will send you some of the links we talked about to YouTube and um, get, get you directly to Dr. Wilson's presentation. So that's really good news. Um, all right. I think we, I'm going to, Double check, they're thanking you for your time. And we're grabbing emails, so that is it. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much mm -hmm. for sharing your expertise with us this evening thank and you. this morning and wherever we may be. And uh, thank you all so much for attending. Wherever we are. That's exactly right. <laughs> Blessings, thank you all. Take care. <laughs>